The issues that matter, the newsmakers who impact our lives. This is Missouri Viewpoints with Mike Ferguson. Can you believe it? It is November and the holidays are here as well as everything that comes with the holiday season. Now, while we tend to focus on gift giving and holiday traditions these last couple of months, local communities and state officials are looking ahead to 2017. They want to figure out what will bring jobs to your town and improve our way of life in Missouri. Hi, I'm Mike Ferguson. Thank you for being a part of Missouri Viewpoints. We're coming to you from the Lindenwood University campus in St. Charles. How should your community promote itself when it comes to bringing jobs and new neighbors to town. Does the same approach that works for Kansas City or St. Louis work for smaller cities like Columbia, Springfield, Joplin, or St. Joseph? And what about the more rural communities? Wendell Cox is with the Show Me Institute, which as a matter of disclosure, is one of the sponsors of this program. Wendell, welcome to Missouri Viewpoints. Thank you, glad to be with you. Economic development. Here we are, of course, uh, you know, the election year that we've had all year long, frankly, the last uh, year and a half, all we've heard are candidates talking about economic development. Uh, we're going to bring jobs, we're going to bring people, we're going to improve schools, we're going to clean up our cities. Kind of the same thing we've been hearing for election cycles since, oh, I don't know about George Washington <laughs> in our country. Uh, but it is something everybody takes very, very personally, whether you're in a big city or a small town. Right, right. Well, it seems to me the most important thing is to make sure your community has the right kind of indicators to attract business. I mean, I'm a bit of a skeptic on how much difference it makes to have a great economic development department. People move where housing is affordable, where, lives are, where, where life is good, livable communities, and by livable I mean low cost of living, good traffic, a place where you can uh, raise your family from before you have children to the point that you have children and move later. Um, and, and, and these are things, frankly, that Missouri communities, especially the big ones, Kansas City and St. Louis, do very well on. And that's one of the things that, just based on those outlying, I would think the whole state would be fairly competitive because when it becomes, when it comes down to dollar versus dollar cost of living, doing business, and when it comes to homes and things like that, we are. It takes fewer dollars, I should say. I don't want to say it's cheaper, you know, but for instance, what you can buy for $200,000 in a home here would get you next to nothing on the West Coast in some areas. Or even in Denver. Think about yeah. Denver, which is your closest big city to Kansas City if you go west. In Denver, the current uh, uh, cost of living adjusted income is about 10000 for a family higher than Kansas City. I'm sorry, the current nominal income. Yeah. If you make it cost of living, it's only about 3000 more. So Kansas City and St. Louis both do very well with respect to, uh, to incomes. Every April, people get elected to city councils across our state. Uh, of course, every uh, you know August and November, we elect people to the legislature and uh, to the statewide offices, and they always want to talk about how we're going to bring jobs here, how we're going to grow businesses here. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the main arguments is government doesn't do that. Government sets the environment for it. Right. I tend to fall personally on that side of the argument. What can government be doing, whether it's the local or the state level, to make our communities the most marketable that they can be? What's more important is what they don't do. I mean, if you want to know about disaster, look at California, which has been rated 50th in the nation for business friendliness by, by Chief Executive Magazine for 10 years now. Look at New York, that has added so little population since 1968, when it was the largest state in the country. What you've got to do is avoid the traps that places like California have gotten into. Uh, uh, strong urban planning requirements, building, uh, you know, drawing lines around cities that force prices up. So that a $200,000 house in Kansas City or San Francisco or, 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 or St. Louis would end up costing eight or nine hundred thousand in, in, in San Francisco. Um, here, for example, in both the big cities and across the state, you have a great freeway system. Kansas City probably has the best freeway system in the country. It has, of course, uh, it's rated as the best in the world, along with Richmond, Virginia, by TomTom, Tom, the people that do these kinds of uh, 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 ratings. But the point is, uh, you need to have a community that is livable, you can get around, and it's inexpensive. And the key is to avoid the awful 
policy decisions that are being made in places like California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, and the Northeast. And I want to come back to some of those specifics in a moment. Uh, in the corporate world, many times in the government world, people throw out terms like best practices. In other words, look at what other cities who are growing, look at what they're doing, and let's do that because it's working there, so it's got to be working here. So if Denver is growing in a certain area, let's do what Denver does. If uh, you know Cincinnati is growing in a certain area, then we need to do that. Uh, are there elements where, where all cities should be doing that on the municipal level, or is that something that we need to separate out public policy from, uh, from the private sector? Well, it's not just the municipal level, it's the regional level as well, the metropolitan area level and so on. And when it comes to, for instance, uh, you mentioned uh, housing being uh, affordable. Uh, one of the things that uh, I know Kansas City is doing, and I think St. Louis is doing uh, as well, uh, you can also see elements of this in Springfield and Columbia, is they are attracting uh, young professionals, uh, young couples, young singles. Uh, who get into the city, sometimes in the urban core, in the downtown area, or in Kansas City, the power and light area, and then they start having kids, and then they want to get out of Kansas City, or they want to get out of St. Louis, and they want to get into a suburb, or they want to move somewhere else where, they, frankly, the education is better. Well, and it's bigger than that, because be aware that in California, they are in the process of implementing regulations that will largely make it illegal to build detached houses in the suburbs. In other words, if you move to California, you may move there because of, you know, downtown L.A. is a nice, vibrant place that's growing at this point. Not growing as fast as the rest of the community, but it's growing. But when you have kids, where can you go? First of all, the house prices are too expensive to afford, and the housing that could be affordable on the urban fringe is not permitted to be built. And that is the thrust of urban planning around the world at this point. Places like Kansas City and St. Louis, if they want to be as bad as California, they can. But if they want to be themselves, they'll do well. I mean, think about it. California has lost 1.7 million domestic migrants in the last 20 years. 1.7 more people have moved to other states as have moved into California. Now, if I'd told you that was going to be the case in 1980, you would have said that I'm crazy. It is, you know, it is housing affordability. A lot of academic studies say that. And also the terrible business environment. I mean, Toyota just moved to, uh, uh, to Texas from California. And the companies that are exiting California are unbelievable. It has nothing to do with economic development activity in, in Texas. It has to do with Texas has the environment that businesses want to be in. And that's part of the, uh, the series of the uh, How Many Walks. Looked at that very closely as well. We are visiting with Wendell Cox from the Show Me Institute. Okay, let's talk about those policies you mentioned, and specifically, what should our leaders in Missouri be doing or stop doing in order to attract the companies that are looking to leave places like California or looking to leave places like New York, and including the workers who are looking to leave. So what should we be doing as we're in a couple months? We've got the legislature going back into session, and city halls are operating year-round anyway. You really don't have to change much. You need to avoid the bad practices. You need to avoid things that increase the price of housing and, as a result, reduce the standard of living and increase poverty, something that is going on every day in California and Oregon and Washington. Any specific uh, policies? That, oh, yeah. Uh, what you yeah. do is you allow urban fringe development to continue. It's got to be environmentally friendly and all that kind of thing, but you don't stop development on the urban fringe. Uh, because when you do that, you create a scarcity of land, you raise the prices, and you get into a situation that people can't afford anymore. The other thing you need to do is to recognize, despite all of the political correct, politically correct thought to the contrary, this nation, and frankly Europe as well, operate on automobiles. Transit is wonderful. It does a nice job of getting people downtown, especially in a few places like New York and Chicago. But more than 90% of the travel to work is by automobile. And that means you're not, you, you've got to provide for that demand. And Kansas City and St. Louis do that well, and the rest of the state as well. Don't get caught into this sort of anti-freeway rhetoric that imagines that you can walk to work or ride a bicycle to work. Yes, indeed, some people can. If you live in the Power and Light District, you can do that. But the fact is, the two million people of the Kansas City area don't live in the Power and Light District, only a small percentage do. And there's a big push. Um, part of that, I think, is the push for more density uh, and less, uh, and more reliance on public transportation. Very recently, I rode the streetcar for the first time, frankly, just to do it. Uh, and it was nice. It was sure, fine. Uh, sure. um, you know, my girlfriend and I were, were on that. And uh, it didn't change the amount of money that we spent at the destination. Uh, but part of that is uh, almost an environmental uh, argument for mass transportation. To me, 
as a parent, I want the flexibility to be able to go wherever I want to go. Well, regrettably, uh, the environmental arguments are terrible. Um, if you were interested, for example, in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, seriously interested, you would measure everything you do by the cost per ton reduced never gets into the equation. The problem with transit, and it's really good, I mean 75 percent of the people who work in Manhattan south of 59th Street take transit to work. In Sansa City, the number of people that get, get to work in downtown KC is like 10 percent. Right. So the point is that transit can't serve the whole community. It doesn't anywhere in Europe or the United States. It does a good job getting you to the core or to downtown. That's it. This month, you've got a, uh, a report, a study on this coming out. Where can people get their hands on it uh, uh, once it comes out? It may be out by the time this airs, but uh, if not, where can they go? To? Uh, go to showmeinstitute.com. I'm sorry, showmeinstitute.org. I'm sorry. Right. All right, Wendell Cox from the Show Me Institute. Uh, we could have probably done two or three shows, entire shows right, on this. Right. Uh, we'll have you back. Let's do it again. Good deal. All okay, right. great.